I'm Darla Mills. We're gonna give it just another minute or so, or should we just go ahead and go, Tracy? Go right ahead. Okay. Um, good morning, everybody. Happy Wednesday. Today, we're um, going to be having a class presented by Mike Pavlik, who's been a master gardener since 2014. And it's called developing, <clears throat> excuse me, developing a vegetable garden in a small backyard space. Uh, there are gonna be a lot of people today, so please stay muted. We have automatically taken your video off to keep the bandwidth uh, within usable so that the video will continue to be good. We've got everybody muted. If you have questions, please type them in the chat. Alicia, who is your other co-host with me today, is going to be gathering your questions. And at the end, we hope to be able to get to it. And so that you can, um, answer we'll get to the questions at the end we're gonna have about an hour and a half today nine to about 10 30 we hope to be able to take care of things at the last five or ten minutes with your questions so it's going to um be posted to the public website after the class we will post the link for the website in our uh in this in the chat we'll get that to you so without any further ado um, let's go ahead and get started with Mike Pavlik on his lovely presentation today. Mike, unmute yourself. Mike, it looks like you're still muted. There. How's that? There you go. All right. Now we're going to have these things popping up all the time, so we'll just take care of that right now. Uh, hopefully you've had your morning drink this morning, uh, coffee, tea, or whatever, because we're going to be moving through this fairly quickly to fit it into the time frame allotted. So this is a UCC Master Gardener's presentation. Uh, let's go to the first page. Okay, we're, this class is developing a vegetable garden in a small backyard setting. That's me, Mike Pavlik. Okay, housekeeping. So we have, uh, the, we're El Dorado County Master Gardeners or volunteers trained by the University of California. Uh, 90 hours of training is what we receive from professors and, and master gardeners alike. Okay, the master gardener goal is to educate our community about research-based horticulture. This class will be recorded and posted on our public website and social media. And we'll do a little housekeeping here. Okay, class objectives today. Uh, review your available space for your garden. Uh, plan and develop your garden. Review and planting options. Maximize harvest. Integrating edibles into your landscape. So topics for today, we'll be going over site selection, design alternatives, site preparation, planting, maintenance, and then any questions at the end as they've already alluded to. So let's start off with site selection. Okay, one of the main things, just like in real estate, location, location, location is important. Uh, you gotta have the right place. And the right place is uh, east to the west is the best exposure for your garden to line up. Uh, six to eight hours of sun, shine, and maintenance here. Morgan, <laughs> excuse me, I have to keep clearing this. Okay, six to eight hours of sunshine is optimal. If you have less than that, there is possibilities. Uh, easy accessibility to hose, outlet, tools, and etc. And this is part of this. Let me get rid of that. Okay, there we go. Uh, close proximity to your house. Because uh, the main thing about gardens, if you're going to have a garden, you're going to want to be using it daily. So as you prepare your meals, whether it's lettuce or, or carrots or whatever from your garden, tomatoes, you want to make sure it's close enough to you that you're going to use it on a daily basis. Uh, design alternatives. Okay, you got to set a budget. How much do you want to spend? As we know, gardeners can spend lots of money. And one of the key things is getting the most for your money. And that's what we hope to be able to tell you about today. Uh, you could go in the ground or and this is keep going here in the ground or in the garden box. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so in the garden box now wood wood 
brick or sandbags. You can make your garden box out of just about anything that'll retain the soil. So that's what's key. Um, okay, rib beds, uh, three feet wide and one foot deep. Now this makes it easier to work from either side, but from one side, it makes it easy also, because most people can reach across a three foot bed. Now you can have larger beds as long as you have space on both sides of the bed to work with it. Okay, straw bale is another option. Uh, Joel Karsten wrote a book about the straw bale gardening. It takes about two weeks to condition the straw bales for you to be able to plant into them. So you have to keep watering them for two weeks to break down the, the, the uh, straw to where you can actually add a little bit of soil on top and plant your plants in it. It appears to work pretty good if you have the space and if you want to have that in your backyard. Uh, also, you can integrate some of your garden into your landscape. Uh, take care of this. Now I'll show you one picture of how that's done right here. This is my side yard. And the plants that are right here are blueberry bushes. So I had a space, not a very big space, but I had a space where I could stick something and I stuck six blueberry plants in there, which do very well there, even though it's kind of a shaded location, they get quite a bit of sun and produce a lot of fruit. Okay, design alternative containers is another option. Uh, light color best plant is, light, is best, because what we know is that when it gets hot up here in, in El Dorado County or wherever you're at close by, it gets hot. Those pots get hot. I had a temperature reading in a pot that I had last year of 104 degrees. Plants don't like that. They want to be cooler. Okay, clay, plastic, fiber, ceramic, the material is really not that relevant. The color is more important. Okay, must have drain holes. That's important. The water has to get out somehow, otherwise your plants will rot in there. Okay, sizes. For cucumber, you can need about a 24-inch pot. Uh, peppers, about an 18-inch pot will do fine. Tomatoes, if they're determinate, determinate means they only grow to about three feet and they produce a lot of fruit at that level. Indeterminate means they'll grow forever, as long as they have the soil conditions are right and you're giving them lots of food and nutrients. I usually wind up topping my indeterminate tomatoes at about five feet because that's all the taller I want them to grow. Any taller than that, you gotta put a ladder on it. Okay, zucchini, about a 24 inch pot. Eggplant about an 18 inch pot. So you can see you could have pots, plants in pots, and still have a, a garden somewhere, anywhere in your, in your backyard, depending how big your yard is. Okay, this was one option. I found this in Popular Science magazine. This is actually two, pot, two pot, five gallon buckets, could be whatever you get them from, and you set this up. And their main thing about this, they call it road ready because if you move, you can take the thing with you. I found it is difficult right now for me to find material that'll continue to draw water up from the below without rotting away. So what I wind up doing is watering it through the top and it drains out and therefore I know the plant's got plenty of water. This is an example of that. So this tomato is in this pot. It's a uh, it determinate tomato. So you can see it's not growing very tall, but you can produce fruit off of it. And like I said, I painted it white because it gets too hot if it's even orange or dark colors. Um, this is another uh, person's idea of using a space on the side of his house. You can see he's laid out these beds so you can still walk through there and you can actually harvest from here and go right into your house. This is another idea if you have a, a deck. Now you want to make sure engineer, uh, structurally that it'll hold all this weight because when you get these pots, the pots out there with the water in them and the soil, it can get quite heavy. But uh, as you can, as soon as this thing clears up, you can see that there's a lot of different things out there. And I'm sorry about the small print, but that was from the, the, the picture that I copied. Um, there is everything there, tomatoes, zucchinis, lettuce, onions, all that in a small setting. This is another option, including a dog. Um, you could have these raised beds, which are actually raised off the ground uh, to make it easier to work with. And uh, you, that's another option on your deck. I don't know if I'd like it on my deck because the water's got to come out of the bottom, but as long as it has drainage and keeps, you know, draining, it'd be okay. 
here's a third, another option, which is called a veggie pod. These are portable, you can move it around. And as you can see, they're growing lettuce and some other vegetables in there, which they use for salads. So you put the cover on when it's cold, or when it's raining, that'll deflect the water. But once you do this, you have a pretty handy tool. Okay, this is my beds. This is my backyard, small area. Um, so you can see the construction of the bed. They're, it's basically the redwood or cedar is the best because it, it will withstand the, the, the moisture and the rotting that takes place. These beds right now are about seven years old. And they're still in pretty good shape. Um, the fabric at the bottom I was, is my, one of my vain attempts to keep tree roots out because I have trees all around my property and the tree roots like to take over the box. So I'll show you what I did to circumvent that. But in the corners, inside corners of each of the boxes, I put a, um, let me get this out here. I put a, a bracket and there's the picture of the bracket. And what this does is it helps keep the corners together. Now the corners are, are screwed together with three three inch screws in them. So they're like deck screws and that helps you keep it together. But this bracket actually works better too because this thing gets eight screws in each corner. So I've not seen any movement on any of my corners using that. And you can tell from this picture, this is another one of my boxes. And there's to the left, there's trees and shrubs and I have a tree right behind it. So you can just imagine what happens to the soil during a growing season. I've cleaned out each of my boxes it will fill a 90 gallon trash uh, recycle bin with roots. So what's the next alternative to that? The next alternative is you raise the bed. I mean, when you have a raised raised bed, you try and keep everything out. So I boarded the bottom of the bed, put the three uh, four by fours down and they're pressure treated so they won't rot away very easily and they're on top of bricks and therefore we're raising it off the ground because the problem I'm having is keeping the roots out of the box. So then this is what it looks like when it's down and attached. So there you have the, what you have is a really raised bed. The fabric will keep the weeds out. And what I found from one year is that the roots go under the fabric and don't come in the box. So problem solved. Okay, little maintenance here. Okay, site preparation, drainage is important. First, if you're gonna go in the ground with the garden, you wanna make sure you dig a hole about six inches deep, fill it with water and wait a half hour. After a half hour, if the water's gone, then you know you have pretty good drainage and your soil's good, you don't need to do much improvement. But if after a half hour, that water's still there, either you wanna find another location or you're gonna to have to work that soil build in amendments and so forth, so that you can have drainage so the plants won't rot to death. And that's why most people go to raised beds because you don't have to worry about that. Soil condition. Okay, clay, loamy, sound, sandy soil is ideal, obviously, some combination of those. Uh, pH five and a half to seven, because it's kind of neutral. Uh, if you're doing blueberries, it's more on the, the low end, more four to five. If you're doing just regular plants like tomatoes and so forth, five and a half to seven is, is ideal. Uh, you can get your soil tested if you're in the ground from a lab or a kit, and that'll tell you what amendments you may have to add to make your soil habitable for the plants. Planting mix is if you're in a box or a, or a pot, what type of mix do you wanna have in there? Now you can do prepackaged or bulk, uh, depending if we're filling all three of those beds, each of those beds are f roughly 40 square feet. So you might want to, or 40 cubic feet, you might want to think about getting bulk. I did prepackaged and it took me a lot of bags to fill those up. Now the ideal mix, according to UC Master Gardener, is one third peat moss, one third compost, and one third vermiculite. Once you get your box established, then each year you can top it off with more, more compost. And what I usually do is in the spring, early spring, like now, I put uh, two bags of, uh, of chicken manure on my beds so that the rain can help break it down. Because it takes about two weeks to kind of cool it off because chicken manure, steer manure, even the ones that you buy from the big box stores, 
uh, is pretty pretty strong. So you want to you want to make it let it sit for a while and let it cure and become more usable. Okay, the calculation for cubic feet is length times width times height. And then you want to change it to cubic yards. If you're going to order like a truckload or something, then it'd be cubic feet divided by 27. So it would give you cubic yards. Like the, my, one, of bed, my, one of my beds is 40 cubic feet. So that's a little bit more than a yard. So you can see how much soil we're talking about. Okay, amendments. Amendments are important if, like you're in the, if you're in the ground and you're trying to improve your soil. Okay, compost is a very good way of doing that. Either you can make your own compost or you can buy it either at a nursery or a big box store. Decomposed leaves, what I do is every fall, I go out with my uh, shredder vac and I pick up the leaves in the neighborhood. So I wind up with a big pile of, of shredded leaves, which I use to cover my beds in the winter. And then in the spring, I put another layer on. And then what happens is during the, the rains and everything, they kind of decompose and become soil. So that works out pretty good. Um, fertilization. Okay, you want to avoid heavy nitrogen. Even cucumbers and lettuce and all that do not like uh, heavy nitrogen. They want some nitrogen. But most vegetable plants are more low nitrogen, more potassium, more, more phosphorus because they're producing fruits and flowers and vegetables. Uh, manure, like I said, let it stand for two to three weeks. Hopefully it rains in between. If not, you should water it down. That would help it cure a little bit. And basically with adding compost to your, your box every year, you should have the right fertilization. So you need very little. I use a uh, fish, fish fertilizer during the growing season. I'll do that once a month and it seems to work really well. Okay, watering options, water by hose bucket. Uh, it's really how, depending how far away you are from your water source. If you have a hose right there, you can use a hose or a bucket. What I found is, is that those wands that you can buy at the big box stores, with my water pressure of about 45 PSI, I get about five gallons per minute out of it. So it really depends on your water pressure. The best way, and the obviously the less work intensive way is, oh, go back. Uh, is to use a drip or soaker hose. Now in my boxes, I've connected it to my uh, main valve watering system, and each of them has four drip lines in it. They're the inline drippers, and they cover the length of the box. So what I've learned over the years is that you're really not watering the plant, you're watering the soil. The plant will find the water if you put it in the soil for it. So I run two of the lines fairly close to the plants I put in the ground, and two lines out about a foot or so, so that they can go get that. And they will do that. They'll go out and get it and plants do very well. Okay. Okay, planting. Okay, last freeze date. Uh, the planting guide that the master gardeners sell, which we don't have for sale today because we're remote. You can probably get one at the office though, tells you what date to plant either seeds or plants for each different vegetable in spring and fall. And what we know is that in Eldorado Hills, which is where I live, the last frost is April 15th. If you're in Placerville or higher, then your last frost date is probably going to be Mother's Day, so May. But, you know, you want to make sure you keep an eye on that because you can put plants out early. I put plants out in March before, but in order to do that, you have to provide protection from the cold. One way of doing that is either row covers or walls of water. Walls of water is a set of plastic tubes that they're in a circle. You fill them with water. During the day, the sun warms up the water. At night, the plant stays warm. And it closes pretty much around the top. And what I found is you can, I can put tomato plants out in March. If I put the walls of water around them, I'm going to do a little maintenance here. Uh, waters, the walls of water around them. And then by the time it gets warm enough, you take it away and the plants are already about a foot tall already. All right, plant selection. This is important. You know, what you want to grow is what you want to eat. You probably don't want to, unless you grow stuff to give away, which we do also. You know, there's a program called uh, Grow a Row for, for the Food Bank, and you can do that. And so make sure you're growing what you want to eat. 
uh, Master Gardener plant sales coming up April 17th. If you haven't got your seeds or plants yet, uh, they don't sell seeds, but they do sell plants. So if you want to take that route, it's April 17th at the demonstration garden. And uh, there'll be more information on that coming out in the coming weeks. But that's a good place to buy all your plants, perennials, annuals, vegetable plants. They're all for sale there and they're for a good cause. Okay, now we'll talk about perennial versus annual plants. Um, this is important because if you plant a perennial plant in your, in your garden bed, it's there for a long time, 10 years, 15 years. That could be like either berries, raspberries, blackberries, blueberries, artichokes, asparagus. They're gonna take up that spot for a long time and you won't be able to use it for anything else. Um, what we usually do is the annual plants like lettuce, tomatoes, cucumbers, cantaloupes, melons, any of those things which grow one season and they're out. So now you can grow other things in that box. Plus the other thing is in a box, you have a lot of room. In, which is different than in the ground because you have a square area. And so you could put tomatoes and lettuce in the same box or tomatoes and peppers in the same box because there's plenty of room to do that. So, you know, you have to make the decision who, what's going in the box. Now that one section where I planted the blueberries, that's permanent. I'm not putting anything else there. But in my beds, I, I would rather not do that. Now some asparagus, is a good thing, but like I said, they'll, those will be around for 20 years. Okay, now we're going to talk about start from seed or by plant. Uh, seeds require time and patience. It's like a nursery. Basically, you have to have space for a nursery. There's different ways of doing starting from seed. Uh, if you go to the stores, you'll see that they have the trays that you can put your seeds into in your soil, and then they sell a heating mat underneath. Some people put their seed trays, the, the trays up on top of the refrigerator, because if you ever felt the top of your refrigerator, it's warm up there. But the, if you can't, then you need it like a set of grow lights and a, and a warming mat. I've got a little different approach to that, and I'll show you that in a few minutes. Well, if you're going to buy plants, make sure you buy good quality plants. Now, we've seen tomato plants that are about, you know, two feet tall and really spindly looking. You can still use those, but the trick is you got to plant them deeper so that there's only about three or four inches of the plant showing off the top of the surface. So the ideal thing is to find tomato plants that are about four to five inches tall, ideally. Uh, same thing for others like cucumbers and so forth. Okay, microgreens is a little different feature. Uh, I don't know if anybody's ever tried this. This is it for indoor gardening, actually. It's the fastest crop you will grow. Uh, it grows indoors on a shelf or somewhere where there's some sunlight. And what you're doing is you're basically planting seeds of different types of plants, either vegetables or flowers, and you're, you're harvesting the leaves within weeks. In other words, it's not going to be an all season thing. You do this like every two to three weeks. So you harvest the leaves when they're one, to half, one and a half inches tall. And people use those in your salad. So, you know, it's like a little different thing. Some people say they have a very good flavor. I've not tried it, but I've heard good things about it. Uh, you can do like say vegetables, herbs, and flowers. And you harvest with scissors just above the soil line. Now that's one crop. Once you cut it, it's not gonna leaf out anymore. And I'll show you a picture here. So this is kind of the tray that people use. And you can see that the, the seeds has rooted and they've grown to about an inch or inch and a half to a high. And the bottom picture shows, you know, a bunch of leaves. So what you want to do is cut those leaves off and you can use those in your salad. It's just a different technique. Here's an interesting thing. I found this in one of the catalogs. Uh, this is a plant that has two types of tomatoes on it. It has cherry tomatoes and also slicing tomatoes. And it takes up the same amount of space. So that's pretty interesting if you're, like we're talking about, if you're a small space like we are, we don't have a lot of room, you can do a lot of combination plants. Okay, this is the way I start my seeds. I have the trays with the soil and so forth and marked off what I planted. And then because I have the time, and here's the other thing, if you're working full time, may not be a good way to do it, but if you're like now, when since a lot of people are working from home, you probably have time to do it. So what I do is I put them outside every day. 
uh, in the sun. And the sun actually warms the soil up and, and provides a lot of energy. And you can see some of them are starting to come up in the trays on the right. And then pretty soon you start, it starts to look like this. And every day, now it takes more watering because they're gonna dry out really quick out there in the sun. So every day I water them. And every night I do before I put them into the house. Now at night, they go under the lights. Now it, it's really important that once the plants are starting to grow like these are, that they get light for about 14 hours a day. So you put them outside for 10 or 12, then you bring them in for two or three. Um, and it works really good. So within two weeks, you have something that looks like this, two to three weeks. Now these plants are ready now to be put out. The front group is all flowers, the back group is, is cucumbers and melons and so forth. But that's just a different way of doing it if you have the time and to do that. Okay, maximize food production. What are we talking about here? We're talking about planting bush type varieties, which are smaller growing plants that produce almost as much fruit as some of the bigger ones. Uh, well, vegetables that produce multiple crops. Some people like corn. Now the question is, if you grow corn in a box, you get one crop and that corn takes a lot of nutrients out of the soil. So you have to replenish all those nutrients if you wanna have something following that crop. Now, if you have cucumbers, tomatoes, um, squash, or any of those, they produce multiple crops. You can get multiple fruit off of them. So that's what we're trying to do is maximize our food production from the space that we have. Okay, plant a pl placement according to height. Uh, taller plants in the back is common sense because if they put the taller plants in the front, they're gonna shade everybody else. Okay, lay out a watering system at planting time. Once you plant your box, then you wanna lay out your watering system to where the plants are. But what I've done is I've laid out four lines of watering. So wherever my plants are, I kind of shuff, shuffle the lines either closer or further away from them so that the water is there. Okay, this is a, uh, just as a recommendation, one of the tomato varieties that I've grown the last several years, it's a 2017 uh, AAS award winner described as an 18 inch determinate plant that produces 100 tomatoes per year per plant. Uh, what you can see is that three plants I've had in 2017 were about 24 to 52 inches tall and they picked 2,500 tomatoes off of them. And in 2018 with three of about 36, 1,400, you can see that there's, they're very productive plants, obviously more than the 100 that they talk about, but they have to be you know, conservative when they list it on their website. So I found these at Totally Tomatoes. I'm sure there's some other sites that have them, but they're, they're, they're a neat plant. They only grow about um, 36 to 40 inches tall, and they produce hundreds, actually maybe thousands, <laughs> hundreds of, tomato, of tomatoes. And what they look like, is this. They're yellow. They're about, uh, they can go anywhere from three quarters of an inch to one and a half inches big, depending on if they're the first ones out. But they're, they're mild. If people have problem with acidity in tomatoes, these are very good. I've, uh, they're, they're tasty. They're, they're very mild. And this is, okay, the plant, two plants on either end of this box are that, that tomato, that, that uh, patio type. And you can see they're only about three feet tall, so you don't need a lot of caging, and they'll produce all summer long. The two in the middle are indeterminate tomatoes that I've cropped at about five feet. So you have to do that or else, you know, you're going to have 20 foot tall plants. But that's, in essence, a layout that you could have. You could have four tomato plants and one, this is a 12 foot box, and they, they're doing just fine. Okay, this is another type of tomato, it's called Sugar Rush, and it produces thousands of these little, uh, they're probably about uh, three quarters to an inch, and they're very crunchy and very tasty. And you can even do artwork with them, so this is tomato art. Okay, providing support, cages, etc. cetera. Uh, construction wire cages, uh, they have six inch holes, spacing, and right now I'm having trouble finding them other than in 150 foot roll. But uh, one time I was able to find them in a 50 foot roll and I was able to construct some cages out of them. 
So finding them is, is a key thing. You can get, they, they sell them at the box stores, but they're only about four feet tall. Five feet is actually ideal. Um, these work really well, 24 inch diameter. So you're making a circle out of it. Uh, Cukes, squash, melons grow vertically to save space. We try and do vertical as much as possible because we're not, we're space restricted. So any of these things will grow up and I'll show you a picture of that coming up here fairly soon. Okay, Square Foot Garden, Mel Bartholomew uh, wrote a book. Of, it's an intensive gardening method. Sometimes people say it was developed in Europe. And what they do is they take a square foot of gardening space and they grow multiple types of vegetables in that square foot. So you could have, and you have to be careful, you can't do it. You can do a small tomato plant, but not a big one. And the small one will probably take up the whole square foot. But let's say you planted carrots and, and maybe uh, lettuce or something in that square foot. That's what you're doing. So you're maximizing each square foot of your garden. Okay, it's important to keep a detailed planting journal. I started that you know, about six years ago. And what it tells you is what worked and what didn't. You know, everything's not gonna run smoothly all the time. There's gonna be problems, you're gonna run into situations. So you wanna make sure you journal all that so you know what, what worked and what didn't and what, what you can maybe change for next year. Also, what was planted where? In a small garden, like we're talking a small space garden, it's almost impossible to do a lot of rotation. If you have the space, like I have three boxes, I can kind of rotate plants around because it's important. You almost don't really want to plant the same plant in the same spot every year. Now you can get away with that if you prepare the soil right by doing a lot of nutrients, building back in, putting a lot of compost in, you can overcome some of that. Sometimes you wind up with a pest that will come back because you've done something in the one space more than once. A little housekeeping there. Okay, this is what we're talking about with a, with a cage. This is about five feet tall and the spacing is about six inches. So that gives you plenty of room to uh, put the, as the plant grows, you keep moving it inside the cage because it'll want to come outside. And then it gives you room to stick your arms in there and harvest. And if these, this is about five feet tall, and that's about the ideal height, because then you can have a five to six foot tomato plant, which is probably as tall as you really want to go. Uh, it's also useful for small plants too, but uh, the big plants are what, you're, what we're doing this for. So that, that's it, I, but you know, finding it in less than 150 foot rolls is a challenge right now, unless you could go together with a couple of friends. Okay, we talked about earlier about trellising your cucumber plants. This is exactly what we did here. So these are, these are probably 12 cucumber plants in this box and they're winding their way up the, up the grade. Now, what, what is nice about this is it makes it easy to pick the fruit, right? You go behind it or in front of it and you can see the fruit actually hanging down. And what happens is you get straighter cucumbers hanging from the, the trellis. It's just gravity, I guess, you know, because sometimes on the ground you get some curvy ones and curly ones, but it's important that, you know, you keep picking them as often as you can because otherwise the plant will go dormant on you. But that is the way we're talking. You could do squash, cantaloupes, uh, corn, any, not corn, but squash, cantaloupes, and cucumbers and so forth like this successfully. Okay, this is, uh, I use this as a spring garden. So these are peas. As you can see, the peas like that, they grow up on there and it's easy to pick peas off of there also. But the trellis works really good. And basically the trellis is the same construction wire that I said before, only it covers the whole length of the box, which means it's about 10, 12 feet. And it's about five, and five feet tall. So it works really well. Oh, this is a, an interesting thing. I found this in a magazine. This is a person's front yard. I don't know if we can get away with that much here in, in El Dorado Hills, but somewhere you might be able to. And, and he's spaced this out really nice. There's multiple boxes, multiple levels. He's even got some in-ground plantings there. And he's got a nice arbor walking in there. So you can grow a lot of stuff in a, in a really small space.
I'm going along pretty quick here. Um, okay, maintenance. <coughs> Uh, check irrigation system regularly. Uh, that's important because why? Number one, uh, because creatures are around, but make sure you buy pressure compensating drips. Now what they do is no matter what the water pressure is, if it's a one gallon dripper, it's gonna give you one gallon. If you don't buy pressure compensating drips, if you have a, one, a pressure surge or a pressure lag, then you're gonna get either less or more than one gallon. They're a little bit more expensive, but they're worth the price. Okay, drips will sometimes fail. We know that, right? Uh, animals like to chew on the hoses. Uh, other things happen. They get clogged. They, they actually, actually had some just outright fail. They stop or they, what they do is the water comes out in one straight stream, stream instead of a drip. And then you have to replace them. So, but animals do like, you know, you get squirrels, you get rats, they think it's a good water source. Okay, keep weeds out of your beds, right? They use plant and food and water. So it's easy to weed beds, because obviously if you're out there every day looking at it, you see a weed pop up, you just pull it and you lay it on top and it'll decompose and become part of your soil. But yes, you want to make sure that it doesn't get overgrown with weeds because it's, it's tough enough for the plants to survive without that extra uh, thing. Okay, mulch plants keep soil cool and moist. It's very important to do this in the summer here because it gets 100 degrees out. And you want to keep that soil, soil temperature down, plus it, it conserves some of your moisture. Uh, you can use various materials, um, grass, straw, and uh, the key, important thing is it keeps weeds from germinating and keeps, and, you know, it just makes everything look better. Uh, you want to do about three inches thick because we know that this stuff will break down over the year. It also, you want to make sure you keep it about six inches from your plant trunk because you get it too close to the plant, you could cause uh, mold and it would possibly rot and kill your plant. So just keep it away from the plant a little bit. Okay, protect plants from wildlife. The creatures on the screen are just part of your problem. Um, bird netting works for birds. If you have like uh, uh, blueberries, any type of berries, and you're, you're trying to protect them from the birds, you need to net them. I don't have, seem to have that problem, but I've heard that it can be uh, pretty bad. The other thing is, is plant, this is an interesting one. Uh, you plant sunflowers nearby your garden keep the goldfinches from eating your plant leaves. I had a year where I was losing the leaves off my cucumber and, uh, and cantaloupe plants and I was wondering what the heck was eating it because I didn't see any bugs on them or anything or caterpillars and it turned out the goldfinches were, were eating them themselves. And what they would do is if you ever see a, like a sunflower leaf, it's pretty big. By the time the goldfinches were done, it was just veins. That's all it was, just like a skeleton of the leaves really not a lot left. And so I said, okay, well, the best way to do that is give them something to eat. And so you plant sunflowers and they're pretty happy with that. They'll eat the sunflower leaves and leave your vegetable leaves alone. You can also net them, but you know, the netting has to be pretty small because goldfinches are pretty small. Okay, use a Hardware cloth or screen on the barrier on the bottom of your garden box to keep out voles or other small animals. What I did is I enclosed the bottom of my box, which gives you some protection. Then I also put cloth down. But if, you're, if your box is sitting on the ground and if you have critters coming in, you're going to need to do this hardware cloth or barrier on the bottom, which will help keep them out. Now, they may find another route to get to your box, but they won't come through the bottom. Okay, this tomato plant has a situation going on with it. Uh, looks pretty healthy on the bottom. Top looks kind of weird though. There's no leaves up there. So in my class, I'd usually ask people to tell me what they think the problem is, but this is a little different situation. So I'm going to let you know what it is. It's, it's a uh, tomato hornworm is what's been up there. There's, there's only two of them, but you can see how much damage two hornworms can do if you don't find them right away. Now, the interesting thing about the hornworms, everybody's seen them, they're the green uh, 
beautiful creatures with a little point on their tail. Nobody likes to touch them. Hair pliers works. You can pull them off with pliers. My birds love it when I pull them off and put it in their bird feeder. They'd rather you kill them a little bit before you do that so they don't run away. But um, yeah, you have to make sure you keep these things under control. If you start to see leaves disappearing, look for their, their frass or their, their um, materials and you'll see that there's like black things along the bottom of, from underneath where they're at. One of the methods I found also is if you spray the tomato plant with water, they'll start clicking. They make a clicking sound. So that kind of gives them away too. So we're burning through this. Um, in fact, this is the end almost. Okay, an old Chinese proverb says, if you wish to be happy for a few hours, drink wine until your head spins pleasantly. If you wish to be happy for a few days, get married and hide away. If you wish to be happy for a week, roast a pig and have a feast. If you wish to be happy all of your life, become a gardener. Uh, there will be a follow-up survey. Uh, Master Gardeners will be requesting your email address so they, well, they will, hopefully they, you provide it. Because UCE, UCCE will be sending out a survey a couple of months after the class to see if you, any of the, the information we provided was useful and whether you implemented the information from the class. That gives us more follow-up information on how we can improve the classes. Uh, references, uh, these are my references for the, for the presentation. And uh, this is UCC Master Gardeners of Everett County. This is the office, office hours, the phone number, the website. Anybody who's interested in becoming a Master Gardener can complete the online uh, Master Gardener Training Interest online form at our website and uh, therefore become a master gardener, go through the training. Thank you. Now we'll take any questions now. Okay, here's the questions that I got for you, Mike. Uh, can we get copies of the slides? Uh, for there's... everybody's, I'll, I'll broach that one, sorry. For that okay, one, okay. the presentation information will be available online shortly after this class is done. And here's the link for everybody again as well in the chat. And next question. I have a concrete base. If I build a box, what should I use for the bottom? So you're building a box on a concrete patio or something like that is what I'm understanding? I don't have more context. That's all that I got out of chat. Okay, so if you're if you're building on a, on a patio, uh, you really don't need to put a bottom on it. Uh, you'll have water draining out, and probably at first, when you first fill your box, you'll have uh, uh, water, dirty water coming out from the soil. Eventually, that'll cease, but you'll still have water dripping out. So you just have to be sure that it's okay that the water's there. You know, depending where in the middle of your patio or off the end, but a concrete base works fine. As long as you have a box that it's about a foot deep, because that gives the plants a lot of room to uh, spread their roots out. Thank you. What kind of leaf vacuum do you use, Mike? Uh, well, my leaf vacuum is about 30 years old. I bought it from Sears at the time. I know they still sell them. It's, it's, a, it's a, like a zipper shredder mulch vacuum, uh, which works really sweet. Um, I've seen it before because you can actually uh, chip a two inch branch in it and then it's like a vacuum. You just run it over the leaves, it sucks them up in the front, shreds them, puts them in the bag. And you empty the bag into a wheelbarrow as you go along and you can collect a lot of leaves and it works really, really well. And I use mine a lot. Sounds like an excellent tool to have for sure. Oh, it is, yeah. Um, here's one. Could Mike talk a bit more about using pressure treated wood for raised garden beds? I know he was just using it as a spacer. I've heard cautions about not using it in garden beds. Please advise. Yes, uh, definitely you don't want to use it as part of your box. What I did is I used pressure treated four by fours under my box. You notice I had a, a wood bottom. So there's a separation between my box and the actual pressure treated wood. The only reason I used it there is because those will last a long time. You don't want to use that material for your box, though, because it would leach into your garden. Excellent advice. What are walls of water? Walls of water, um, 
you go to any of the any of the stores, nurseries, big box stores, you'll see that they're about um, about a foot tall, and they're a series of tubes. The tubes have an opening, uh, I'd say about an inch or two. And what you do is you pour water into the, each of the tubes that surrounds the walls of water. And then you put this around your, your plants, around your tomato plants, whatever you have. And like I said, during the day, the sun warms up the water and at night it keeps the plants warm. It could be freezing out, but the, the plants inside the walls of water are probably 20 degrees warmer. And they're pretty inexpensive and they last a long time. Uh, for succession gardening, would you plant seeds about every three weeks? Uh, I would go by the planting guide. Uh, it depends what you're planting. If you're planting like lettuce and stuff and you want a succession of more lettuce, that's probably a good, good time element because lettuce comes up pretty quickly and it uh, comes to harvest pretty quickly. So yeah, something like that. Uh, some people will do that with zucchini even. You know, they'll, they'll plant zucchini and then maybe a month down the road, they plant some more so that you keep going into deep into fall. Sometimes zucchini plants will stop, you know, uh, late summer and you want more of it coming. So yeah, you can do succession planting. Three weeks seems a little close depending on what you're doing, but if it's a small crop that's quick like radishes or, or uh, carrots or any of those things, then that would probably be okay. But anything bigger than that, I would space a little bit further apart, probably a month. Okay. Um, what would you recommend as the best supports for vertically growing cucumbers, squash, or melons? Uh, well, I like the construction wire, uh, but there's trellises you can use. Um, anything that's, that's strong, like wood or, or metal trellis. And it really, you know, what I support that with, because my box is no longer on the ground, so my stakes don't go to the ground, they go to the bottom of my box. I had to go ahead and screw uh, two by twos onto the side of my box to be able to hold up the, uh, the, the trellis itself. So I support it between the, the two by twos and the fence, and that seems to work really good. The, the construction wire to me is the best. Any type of uh, netting or, or fencing like that, uh, metal would probably work just as good. And it um, looks like this might be the last one here. Would you put one head of cabbage or one zucchini plant in a five gallon pot? Um, yes, I would say so. You know, in my presentation, I listed sizes of pots for different plants. Uh, you can definitely grow a head of cabbage or, or uh, what was it, zucchini you said? Uh, yeah. Yeah, you definitely could grow that in, inside of a five gallon pot, yes. Now, if the setup, as you noticed in my presentation, was two five-gallon pots. One, the top one has the soil in it with the holes in the bottom for, and for the material to go through to bring up the water from the one below. The one below acts like a reservoir that you just fill up and you can tell when it gets full because the water will come out the hole on the side. And that keeps your plants well watered during the year. Until the material uh, disintegrates, then you got to water them from the top. Okay, and then I've got one more question just came up. Um, for the containers you're mentioning, are the 18 to 24 measures uh, depth or width? It's the width. The, the width? width? Usually if you get an 18 inch wide pot, it'll be pretty deep because those are pretty good sized pots. So yeah, it's the width of the pot we're talking about. Okay, and what combination of soil or amendment is best for container gardening? Um, the, the, the mixture of, um, of topsoil uh, you know, the, and uh, compost together makes it a, a pretty light if you have to move it around at all. Um, and it works really good for the plant. Uh, what I use, there's some mixes you can buy from the stores that are already prepared. I wouldn't do one that's very heavy, uh, but if they say like compost or um, um, the one I use is called Plus and it's got both compost and soil in it. So it works really, really well. But definitely something light. You don't want heavy soil in there. You can't, don't use, you know, like your, your backyard soil in it. That would be too heavy. Yeah. And um, on days when temperatures hit over 100 degrees, do cucumbers, peppers, or tomatoes benefit from shade cloth? 
Um, hmm. Shade cloth. I would think so. Uh, I grew cucumbers one year in part of my garden, which is in partial shade. So they had sun during the, the morning and early afternoon. And then when it gets hotter, like between two and five, they were in the shade and they seemed to do really well. So I would say shade cloths would help. I, I sometimes, even the ones in the pots by the fence that I showed you that picture of, I would put shade cloth around the bottom of the plant, around the bottom of the base too, to kind of cool it off a little bit. So anything you can do to cool it, as long as you're not blocking a lot of light will help. Okay. Um... Can I use the planting soil they sell at Costco? Uh, yes. Um, that, that's already fertilized a little bit. So you got to be careful at first how much fertilizer you put or uh, you do at first. Um, I would mix it with compost and use that because it, it can be heavy, the soil, if you just do straight soil. But I would use mix it with compost, and that will lighten it up a little bit, plus give you some other nutrients. Now in the pots, you have to water those daily because the pots will dry out fairly quickly in the summer. And also those like with the fish fertilizer, that's once a month you do that. So you use that once a month and water them every day and then everything should be fine. Excellent, thank you so much, Mike. It looks like that's all of the questions that I've seen. Um, and I wanted to thank you for that. Everybody who's listening and still on the call, Please check the links in the chat. Um, we've posted a lot of information and answers to these questions throughout the presentation. And um, look for this online um, probably in a few hours. Thanks so much. And for my master gardeners, if you'll stay on the uh, Zoom, the rest of the folks, thank you so much. I do see a couple questions coming in. Would you email those to us? Um, mg eldorado at ucanr.edu, or you can just Google us, Eldorado Master Gardeners, and you can post questions there as well. So thank you so much for a great class and have a wonderful day. Thanks, everyone. And Mike, if you'll just hold up and, and we'll be on in just a minute. Oh, no problem. Is that what I see? We have 81 questions. What's that, Mike? I see in the chat box there's 81. Oh, I think that's just total chats. That's responses and everything. Oh, is it? Yeah. Hmm. Alicia, good. read him. Read Mike the comment that came from oh, who was it? There was a really great comment thanking Mike for the best ever vegetable class. I want to make sure you see that. Oh, well, how do I do the open chat? Yeah, open chat and scroll towards the bottom. Oh, it opens in the little box over here. Let's see. Okay, here we are. Let's see. Um, oh, let's see. I got to go back. Oh, scroll towards the bottom? Yep. Um, 